All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Mark Stoos, who is the CEO of Proof Analytics. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. And which part of the world are you in today, Mark? I am in Paradise Valley, Arizona, which is right, right in the middle of Phoenix. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And uh, Proof Analytics, uh, the company's Proof Business GPS is the world's best and fastest automated marketing and revenue operation optimization platform. And what we're going to talk today about is um, marketing innovation and revenue optimization. So um, taking advantage of market uh, marketing to deliver real um, business results. Um, so Mark, let, let's get straight into it. I would sure. say over the la over the last while, like marketing has become, I would say that whole thing's become a little confused because there's there are so many marketing tools out there. There's so many analytics. There's people arguing about like, oh inbound marketing versus you know account based marketing versus all these things. And I think people there's a lot of people I speak to who are kind of at that situation where they are just confused on where to focus and and especially when it comes to data and analytics like is which is me which data what data and which analytics are meaningful and which are just kind of nice to have no that's a great question you know i think that that number one you have to you have to always remember that marketing is a multiplier of sales productivity and other areas of business performance and so the key analytic and there is a difference between data which is mm -hmm. a measurement of something like almost like an MBA score, right? If the final score was 72 to 68, that's a measurement, that's data. And that tells you who won, but it tells you nothing else about the game, right? Mm -hmm. It's also completely in the past. And it's really important, right? I'm not saying data is not important. It is, it's the fuel, right? But the analytics is all about cause and effect analysis, right? What actually made this other thing happen? And so when you are a marketer and you are delivering a force multiplier on sales productivity, so that is that means more deals, bigger deals, faster deals than sales would otherwise be able to do if marketing didn't mm -hmm. exist, right? That's the core, that's the core question right there right, then you need to be able to calibrate that and say, okay, this is not only the, the um, extent of the multiplier that different investments that I'm making in marketing are producing on sales or any other part of the business, mm -hmm. but also as all the environmental factors, meaning the, mar the marketplace factors change. And we are in a place right now where the change, the rate of change is not only very fast, but it's very volatile. Mm -hmm. So you have to take all that into account as well, because that is, those are headwinds and tailwinds that either improve the performance of your investments across go to market, right? Or they slow them down or make them harder, or they nullify certain parts. I mean, Great example of this, actually, uh, in the last, say, two or three years with COVID was field marketing events, in-person field marketing events, whether they were at the top of the funnel or further mm -hmm. down, right, uh, targeting customers that already had a lot of intent. So this yep. was all about bigger deals and faster deals. But it all, for obvious reasons, right, it all blew up, right? That no one was doing in-person mm -hmm. events. And it's not about the fact that in-person events suck, right? It's about the fact that things changed and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you're still spending money in that area. You had a problem. Yeah. We, we, we had customers that were able to see the forecasted change far enough ahead in early 2020 to divest, you know, to cancel a lot of their planned right. activities, right? And save a lot of money before all the wheels fell off the wagon. Mm -hmm. Well, but the, and it's interesting there, what you just said though, is that they had the the foresight uh, to see it. So what you said at the beginning was a lot of people track or look at lagging indicators, right? Which is just a historical right. snapshot. And not that that's not, a, you know, obviously it's important in its own right, 
But there's nothing you can do about it at that stage. It's in the past. It's done. It's dust. Correct. It's yeah. it's the lead, leading indicators that that really really count. And I think that's what people find it really ha- find it hard to understand is what are leading indicators. So a leading indicator is anything that that is a proven cause agent to something that has already happened and then continues to happen mm-hmm. going forward, right? This can be stuff that you control or stuff that you don't control. Um, the bottom line here is, is that you have to be able to get credit for anything. You have to be able to do two things. You have to be able to forecast it and you have mm-hmm. to be able to show that your forecast was either correct or have an explainable variance or that you were able to modify in midstream whatever you were doing so that you you know didn't miss your forecast by nearly as much and that is you know if we look at corporate uh performance corporations issue guidance on the year mm-hmm. and then they update that guidance quarterly that's that same thing right mm-hmm. and, and the, um and so not only is that a sale, you know, important on the sales side, and clearly sales leaders and salespeople understand the, the forecasting piece, but marketers really don't. Marketers yeah. have never really had to forecast and then hit something, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not that they're hitting a revenue number per se, because that is a that's a sales objective in, in most yeah. enterprise B2B, right? But they are they're either making it easier, better, faster, cheaper, easier for sales to hit that number, or they're not. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And I think I think one of the other things that maybe marketing folks need to learn a little more kind of going forward is, is the, the, being nimble and flexible, right? Because I do think sometimes, like, as you said, when cir- circumstances change, like, sometimes marketing feels like it's like trying to you know, turn the Titanic on a dime or something, as opposed to having been set up to be able to anticipate, to be able to flex, to be nimble. And I think that's, that's a lot of the future of marketing is how do you, how do you use analytics to figure out where things are going? And then how, how do you set yourself up so you can be flexible enough to react? Absolutely. I mean, and that is not just about marketing, right? That is, that's a business issue. Um, you know, one of the problems with analytics historically is that they have been produced primarily by very smart people using mm-hmm. largely manual tools, right? And so they couldn't create the models and then recompute the models fast enough to be relevant to daily or weekly decision making, right? In businesses, mm-hmm. it was all, you know, even, you know, even multivariable regression analytics. So these are cause and effect analytics. Historically, we're so the uh, the latency was so high that by the time the forecasts and everything else were delivered, everything was still in the past. Right. Right. And so the big step forward, what has really made a huge difference in the last several years is the extensive automation of modeling and recalculation capability. So that now, if you if your business has a clock speed that is daily, weekly, biweekly, monthly, whatever it is, right, those models will automatically recalculate um, and give you what is re- very, I mean, it's not just an analogy, it's actually real, uh, a business GPS on that question, right? And what that, if you think about it on your phone, yep. The way the GPS works is it says, this is where you are. This is where you want to go. Here's a line. Here's your route, right? That's the equivalent to a forecast, Mm -hmm. right? And then it's tracking your progress and it's tracking all the stuff around you that you can't see, like traffic, right? That's either going to speed you up or slow you down. And if it gets bad enough, they're going to say, hey, man, guess what? You got to reroute and here's some options. And that is exactly what automated marketing mix modeling or go to market uh, modeling. There's different names for it, but that's that's what this does. Um, and there's it's very dynamic, it's very accurate, it's very nimble, responsive, agile, 
right? You can scale it mm-hmm. very cost effectively and it's not expensive, right? And that last piece is obviously always important, mm-hmm. but right now it's really important. Yeah. And I, and I feel that it's bringing an extra level of discipline to marketing, maybe a discipline that was perhaps lacking in the past, because let's face it, I mean, you know, mar- marketers, and I include my, you know, we've all been involved in marketing, I'm involved in marketing, but sometimes in the past, we've been very good at being a little bit more nebulous about things, you know, or, and a little bit more kind of maybe a little precious because it's, you know, we're, the, we're supposed to be creative and all of that. But the reality is that um, marketing should be just as data driven, just as, as process driven, just as an analytics driven as you're talking about here. Yeah. And, and I'm not trying to parse words here, sure. but, but it's really the goal here is to be analytics led because mm-hmm. you're, you're operating on a forecast, right? And so when you're driven, it's driven by stuff behind you by definition, right? And, mm-hmm. and that's like driving a car while looking in the rearview mirror, right? I mean, yep. that's not, so I love alliteration as much as the next guy, right? <laughs> the data driven, its popularity is because it's alliterative, yeah. and, right? But it's actually a really, it's not an accurate statement. It's not what we want to be. We want to be analytics led. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really great point there um, about like driving the rear view mirror and not being, you know, data driven. It's, it's like um, it, the alliteration, it's like customer centric. People love that one, but it doesn't actually play out for many organizations. It's a nice bumper sticker. But, but to your point on this one, on data driven, then yes, it, it's, it kind of, um, it's communicating that it's the day. It's just the data, just the data, and it's not. And it's right. and as and, we've and, said, it's the analytics. Yeah, and what we're seeing today, right, is the change is so rapid and so volatile in so many areas right now that the you know not only I mean past was never prologue. It just mm-hmm. felt that way in a more stable situation sometimes. Yeah. But today, there's no way, right? And so this has some extremely practical ramifications. It, uh, it, for all of us, there's no exceptions, right? In a period of very high change, volatile change, your historical experience counts for less, mm-hmm. right? So experience and intuition, these are pattern matching activities that we all do inside our conscious and our subconscious yep. all the time. And if all of a sudden those patterns are invalidated by too much change. You can't, you can't operate that way. You're going to need help. It's not that you suddenly turn stupid, right? It's that you need an aid, right? Um, it's like fighter pilots, right? When, mm-hmm. when things were in World War II, when the average um, plane was running about 500 miles an hour, they had about five gauges, and it was fly by the seat of your pants and the so-called natural pilot, right? Mm-hmm. Um, when all of a sudden everything went supersonic, that didn't work anymore, right? And and all of the variables like this, okay, suddenly happening at that speed was more than the human brain could handle. Sure. And that's when you started to see planes getting a lot more what we think of today as AI, a lot more automation, Right. They're doing a lot of things to remove decisions from the human being in the cockpit um, and leave them with the decisions that are the ones that are most important. Mm-hmm. And so that it's the same thing today in business. Really yeah, is. no, I, I agree with you. And I think that's where like automation and, and uh, digital transformation is, is so um, critically important, because to your point is there's so much going on that you can't possibly keep on top of everything, but you also want to be able to to migrate or help people to be doing the high value things, to be doing the, the creative the things where Absolutely. the human is really central to it and that human can make all the difference. You don't want to bog them down in this other stuff. Or as you said, like in the, in the analogy of the plane, the stuff that they're not able to do anyway. Right. I mean, it, you're absolutely right. This is not about replacing people. You know, I, I went, I, I come out of the software business mm-hmm. um, in the enterprise data center automation 15 years ago. Um, just like every major automation wave in every part of the business, everybody freaks out and says, oh, you know, we're, we're going to lose a lot of jobs. In this case, mm-hmm. it was a lot of data center jobs. 
that is not the way it actually panned out at all, right? What was being automated was all the crap, yeah. all the necessary, highly repetitive, boring, unrewarding crap, right? And so when all that was taken off people's plates, mm -hmm. they had more time for the stuff that really mattered. They had more time for the stuff that was really interesting and strategic. And they had more rewarding careers in the data center. It's yeah. the same thing here. Yeah, no, I, I know I 100% agree. And it's funny because um, those rote, routine, repetitive tasks that people don't want to do that are low value, there's often problems there because you don't want to do them because they're low value. It's often where there's mistakes, where you know the balls drop, mm -hmm. where things are ignored. So um, it is, in fact, elevating elevating the role when you start to automate all of those things. A absolutely. I mean, there is a difference between, uh, so I totally agree with your characterization of a lot of those things being low value, but that does not mean that they're not necessary. Correct. Right. And, and so a lot of people kind of conflate those two ideas and they shouldn't. Yeah, no, no, I, I would totally agree. <laughs> agree with you. I mean, um, the low, um, low value in terms of, yeah, maybe not the greatest use of your time, particularly because you can automate it, but they still need to be done. But if you don't have any automation, those things are probably not always getting done because what do we do? We tend to gravitate towards the things we like, the things we're good at, the things mm -hmm. that don't bore us. And we tend to push the others to, to the side. And unfortunately, a lot of them are foundational and they come back to haunt us. That's right. I mean, actually, that's a lot like the, the relationship between data and analytics, mm -hmm. right? So I'm sure you've heard the analogy around data being oil, like oil, right. crude, mm -hmm. crude oil, right? It's, it's actually, you know, any analogy is going to break if you stretch it too far, right? But that's not a bad analogy in, in this particular case because you need it in order to produce gasoline and whatever else you're going to produce out of, out of it. Um, but... If you were to put crude oil directly into your gas tank in your car, you would have a ruined engine. Mm -hmm. It would not work, right? And so what analytics is with data is what a refinery is with crude oil, right? It is distilling and re refining the data so that it makes sense and produces value yeah. to the end user, right? And that's that's really that's where the analogy with oil and data really works. And and the other thing uh, is that because uh, we came out of this whole thing, do you remember there was big data and everybody was talking about big data and amass as much data as you can, blah blah blah. And and the reality is, it's not really big data. It's it's small relevant relevant data that's analyzed properly. And right. I think that's and I think therefore you know we've gone through this phase right now of just this is crazy data collection to no end. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know. Uh, most business people, when they say big data, what they really mean is we have a lot of data. Yeah. Okay. But that's not the definition of big data. There's seven attributes that a data set has to have in order for it to be a big data data set. Right. Mm -hmm. And by definition, business, the business activities and the measurement of business activities doesn't generate a lot of big data. It generates a lot of, to your point, lean data, mm -hmm. right? So you, you may have a, a, you know, a data lake that it has a lot of data, but if you were to look at the individual data sets, they're small, right? Particularly relative right. to like uh, what you see in the pharmaceutical or healthcare research space. Mm -hmm. Right. That's big data. Right. Yep. Uh, product testing in aerospace. That's big data. Right. So there's a there's a lot of those kinds of things that the bi business data just isn't even in the same league. And yeah. so you don't need a lot of this really heavyweight analytics for 99 percent of your business use cases. I mean, you just don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the important thing is that you just need to know what are the relevant, what are the relevant, what data is relevant to you, and then can it 
be analyzed to provide something valuable, some insight of value. That's right. And so, I mean, the, actually, the way it really works, this is sort of like a, a, a significant riff on the scientific method, is if you're a business guy, if you're a marketer, who whatever, mm -hmm. right? The first thing is, what, what are the decisions that I need to make, right? That where I'm trying to make a better decision on a regular basis, right? Yeah. That leads you straight to a series of business questions that you, you know, those two things are almost like one and the same mm -hmm. um, idea that will then say, OK, this is a, a model framework that will answer that kind of question or help me make that kind of decision better, faster. Um, and then that will say, OK, these are the data sets that we need in order to arm this model so that we get we're able to do all that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if this is not a bottoms up exercise, this is a yeah. tops down exercise, not necessarily organizationally, but in terms of the flow of process. You're starting with the end in mind. You're not starting at the bottom with raw material. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, listen, Mark, this has been, we're bumping up against the end of our time, but this has been fascinating. Like all of Mark's information will be below this video. But before we go, can you please tell people a bit more about you and your business, please? Sure. So um, I'm a longtime large company CMO and CCO who has become a software CEO. Um, and, and that's a whole journey in and of itself, as probably everybody can figure out. Um, Proof Analytics is a company that I founded, a software company that I founded. Uh, we've been going about five and a half years. Um, customers are like Salesforce, Buyer in Germany, Samsung, folks like that, all the way down through, I would say, kind of like the upper end of the mid range. Mm -hmm. um, and we have automated very successfully everything that's, that's necessary for an analyst to create all these models at scale very, very quickly. And then for a business user to look at it and say, ah, I totally understand what's going on here and I know what to do next. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so these are not like a lot of times what you see in analytics is that the so-called business user screens are just yep. kind of dumbed down versions of the analyst screens. That's not what this is. Right. Yeah. And so, that's really what we've, uh, that's what we've done. We're on both AWS and Salesforce platforms. Um, so uh, if you want the URL, it's www.proofanalytics.ai. And yeah. uh, so you can reach me on LinkedIn or anywhere else. Yeah. And as I said, all the information will be below this video. So listen, thanks again, Mark. And thank you all for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon.